All right, so good morning, everyone. And for this session, we will examine the impact uh, stir sh shaking standards have on businesses and how businesses can mitigate the risk of stir shaking and improve their ability to reach customers successfully. I'm Greg Tavares, editor with TMC, and I'll be your moderator. And I have this wonderful panel with me. And if you guys want, can y'all introduce yourselves to the audience? Sure, sure. I'm Alan Percy. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Telco Bridges. Uh, we're a maker of uh, software and hardware solutions for service providers and that enable a lot of the stir shaken solutions in service providers. I'm Jim Dalton with TransNexus and we sell software for service providers and uh, with a variety of applications to enhance their network, uh, least cost routing, toll fraud detection, robocall, prevention, and shaking. And I, oh, I am losing my voice. I am Bailey Langley, and I am the Senior Director Head of Global Channel Marketing for a company called Livevox, and we do contact center as a service. So obviously very involved with the Sir Shaken framework and making sure that our customers' calls get through. All right, thank you. So before we dive into how to mitigate risk of Sir Shaken, we should probably provide some context for those who are not really familiar with it. So, um, Alan, can you give a brief description on what Stir Shaken is and why it was sure. put in place? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Matter of fact, we, uh, Jim and I had a session uh, two days ago here at the conference. We got into some details of that. And we'll, um, if you're really, really interested, we can get you a link to, the, uh, to that session. But in a nutshell, you know, Stir Shaken was, uh, its goal in life was to secure the caller information from uh, the originating uh, caller to the destination caller with the intent being is to try to stop the spoofing and some of the other you know, misbehaving that's happening in the, in the public network. Um, without getting into tremendous detail, in a nutshell, basically what happens is the, the originating service provider um, goes and secures uh, um, a, uh, a certificate that it can then use to sign calls and those signed tokens that then get embedded into the call and that's the role that we play is actually putting these embedded tokens into the call and the originated service provider that call then passes over the SIP or um, potentially even TDM network at the destination service provider that, that's unpacked and verified to make sure that it's valid so that the receiver the recipient of the call then can know that the call the caller information has not been molested, but it also has a couple of features built into it that allow for easy traceback and to find out where the call originally uh, came from, um, which is typically used in, in like, again, like traceback or law enforcement. If they're trying to track down some bad behavior, then they can find out where the call comes from. So it has a couple of side effects, right? This stir shaken. Um, made it now much more difficult for enterprises to use a different telephone number uh, from the number that's, that the call is coming from. And I think probably many of you know that you know, outbound campaigns in enterprise, contact centers, uh, maybe notification applications, these kinds of things, a lot of times you like to be able to use a telephone number that the, call, that the recipient of the call would just hit you know, redial or call back on uh, and stir shaking kind of buggered that all up. It made it hard for that, you know, the calling number to be changed from the actual number that it, that it originated. So there were some work done through the uh, ADIS efforts to try to formalize a mechanism that would allow um, service providers to use numbers, kind of an a proxy arrangement where you use delegated certificates and things like that to be able to make calls using somebody else's phone number and to do so in a, you know, in a proper and legal mechanism. Anyway, so the challenges for service providers are a couple things. One of them is, is you know, the goal is, is to improve your call answer rate, to improve the um, response, to um, uh, you know, have people start to answer the phone again, right? I, you know, I'm sure you, probably you are all like me. If the phone rings, they don't recognize the phone number. I'm not answering it, doesn't matter. Uh, in a lot of cases, don't even listen to the voicemail because I know it's somebody trying to sell me an extended warranty, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, um, we've been, you know, Jim and I and Melee have had some conversations about, you know, how could we give uh, those that are trying to implement enterprise applications some tips and tricks uh, and some information about improving uh, the, uh, the call answer rate uh, and reduce, you know, some of the confusion that happens with stir shake in, in implementations. So that's in a nutshell, that's why, kind of why we're here. 
And of course, you can't talk about stir shaking without discussing attestation. Yeah. So Jim, can you briefly explain what the attestation levels are and how they impact businesses? Sure. So, uh, you know, Alec, that's, I mean, Alan, that's a great uh, kind of overview of the technical side. And uh, can you all hear me? Okay. And uh, so shaking is definitely the digital signature that provides that, you know, integrity end to end that you can verify and trust that calling number. But, you know, when we talk about shaking, it's really a lot more kind of wrapped around it. It's a, it's really a, a trust ecosystem that's driven by the FCC through a couple of bodies. And that's what's really important because, you know, Alan referred to, you know, gives law enforcement a way to, to take measures if somebody abuses the system. And that's, uh, so that's a big part of what shaking is. It's really driven top down by governance authority that sets policies or what are the policies or good calls, who can make certain types of calls and who can be in the ecosystem. And that's implemented through a policy administrator, a company called iConnective is the one company that oversees the entire ecosystem. And I want to, before I got into attestation, I just wanted to share that because that's important, that's unique. You know, it's not just a, a free market system and we love open source, we love open systems, we love free markets, but sometimes you need the regulators to step in and be the single point that really brings it all together from a trust perspective and has the enforcement capability to punish the bad actors. So I think that's a, you know, that's a powerful part of shaking that's unrelated to the technology, but it's important in the US and Canada. And now to tell, talk about attestation, that is the, really the parameter within a shaken passport. And we talk about shaking, it's just a, it's just, it's a JSON token with the calling number, the called number, the timestamp, a little other information with the digital signature, and the attestation of how, how the originating service provider, the company that put that phone call onto the telephone network, what is their level of trust for that calling number? And there are three levels. A, that means the originating service provider, they know exactly what telephone that came from, that call was originated from. They know the calling number, they know the handset, they are fully confident you can trust this number. Wireless phones, you know the telephone number's put into the switch uh, for the call. It can't be spoofed by the calling party. Same for most hosted PBX services. So the calling party, or the, the originating service provider knows for sure if it's an A attestation, you can trust that call and they've put their digital signature on that. And if there was a crime perpetrated, the FCC would be coming to talk to that service provider because they have digitally signed that call. That's powerful from a trust perspective. And then you've got two other attestation levels. B means the service provider, they know what trunk that call came in from. You know, they know where it came from, but they can't be sure about the calling number. And kind of the classic example of B attestation is you provide SIP trunks to an enterprise and they have their own PBX, and you've given them 100 DIDs. But you don't know which DID really made a telephone call when it comes in from a SIP trunk from that enterprise. You know, was that really the CEO calling on that calling number? You know it's his calling number, but it, was it really the CEO who called the bank to authorize a wire transfer? The service provider just doesn't know, because he's not at that level of detail of the PBX. He just knows what trunk it came in on. So that call is gonna get an attestation B. And then the lowest level of attestation is what's called gateway attestation, where you're a wholesale provider, you're getting calls in from you know, another wholesale operator, and they, they're not signed, you know, have no idea where those calling numbers are coming from, who's making those calls, that's attestation C. There's no trust uh, you know, identified with attestation C, you can't trust that number. It doesn't mean it's bad, it just means that the, the service provider that created that shaken passport and signed it had no information about the calling number and where it came from. So anyway, that covers it for attestation. All right, and uh, Maylee, do you have an example of how stir shaken is affecting customer experience that businesses may be unaware of? Yeah, um, let's actually, I'm thinking more of, and again, I apologize, my voice is gone, uh, of like an everyday example. My doctor's office called me to give me lab results, and the number came through as spam likely, so I ignored it, and ended up getting the voicemail. They can't tell me anything in the voicemail, so I have to call them back. 
I can't get a hold of them. We play phone tag, and it was a terrible customer experience for me. Now, put that in the let's put that in a sales context. I was the hottest prospect because I wanted that call, and I knew that company, and they lost me because unbeknownst likely to the customer, their service provider did not take the steps to mitigate stir shaken and get that level of attestation or the high level and so their call was blocked and I would suspect that that doctor that customer had no idea that that's even happening so um, I think that's where this session is really important is to make sure that customers know what to be asking their providers to ensure that it's not impacting your ability to reach your customers and creating this bad experience that doesn't reflect poorly on your provider. It ends up reflecting poorly on your company. And Alan, what are key steps businesses need to take to make sure their service provider is meeting and maintaining stir shaking compliance? Yeah, so the, one of the key things, I think, when you go out to shop for a service provider, you have to ask that question, you know, to where are you along with your with your um, stir shake and integration. As a matter of fact, one of the key things I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, there have been a, a series of deadlines that have occurred over the last year or two when it came to mandating service providers implement stir shake. And some of the service providers do it natively. That's kind of their responsibility. They, you know, they take it seriously. They've natively been signing calls and, and own those attestation and, uh, and certificates. But there are service providers who have delegated this to their upstream service provider. Um, there are, you know, smaller MSPs or you know, smaller retail service providers who don't actually do the signing. Instead, they've dele essentially delegated that to their upstream provider. And as a result of that, in many cases, what happens is they get that B attestation. So that really weakens, you, you know, the credibility of the of the call. Uh, and that causes problems. So it, I think the way to address, if you really want to know, are you going to get that A attestation, which is really what you desire, is to ask that question from that service provider, am I going to get an A attestation on my calls um, to make sure that they get through? And secondly, can I, can I potentially use a delegated certificate so that it's my phone number, I can go to a service provider to run a calling campaign for me and give them permission to use my telephone number on that calling campaign. So, you know, the, the perfect example is, you know, the um, a large high volume notification application where the callback number would be the inbound of your contact center, right? Outbound application makes, you know, let's say thousands of calls, but the callback number, right, the calling number that shows up on their phone um, is, your, the, uh, is the incoming trunk on your contact center. Because if people miss the call and they hit callback, you want that to go into your contact center. But to do that with Stir Shaken, um, it would be important to be able to do that delegated certificate process to be able to make that happen. So you have to ask those questions. You know, are you actually doing the signing yourself or is it done upstream? Probably the sales rep's not going to know, but make them go find out. And then secondly, hey, if I want to run large outbound campaigns, would you be able to work with me on delegated certificates for my, for um, be able to hand that off to another service provider for these kind of campaigns. So those are two questions you probably can use uh, to make get a lot of clarity. And what have each of your companies done to ensure the highest attestation levels of your customers? We can start with Mei Lee. <laughs> Yeah, um, so Livebox, so a lot of companies in kind of the UCAS and CCAS space started talking about stir shaken in kind of late 21, give or take, because that's when a lot of the deadlines were, were coming. Um, but Livebox, as a contact center provider, had actually been working with the FCC and iConnective for over three years prior to those deadlines, um, because they knew that this was coming and they got ahead of it and had taken all the steps to become an authorized service provider to get the SPC or the service provider code token and to you know, get on the robocall mitigation database to make sure that we were at that highest level of attestation. May I add a comment? Go ahead. So, uh, you know, everything you've heard, I totally agree with. And, uh, but for enterprises, when you talk, ask your service provider, I'd, I'd suggest you go one step further. Certainly, like Alan said, you know, can, are my calls going to get an A attestation when they leave your network and go to the public switch telephone network? You definitely need to ask that question. 
But you need to ask, and I would suggest another question. Who are you interconnected with and will that AI attestation pass through the network to get to the far end? And the reason I'm raising that point is we've seen this problem over and over again. Our customers are voice service providers. They're completely SIP based. They don't have any TDM in their network. They buy SIP trunks from one of the tier one uh, operators and they've implemented Shake and they make a call. They call their cell phone. They call their friends. They say, has that call, did, you know, is it verified? Did you get a check? You know, can you see on your phone if it was verified? Passport did not get past their intermediate provider because their intermediate provider takes calls in SIP and then puts it onto their TDM transit network. And that passport gets dropped immediately. And uh, this was hard to explain. We had one customer who says, it's not working, it's not working. We said, you know, we're looking at the wire trace, it's going out to tier, tier one provider, you know, pick which one you want. And uh, finally they came clean and said, yeah, we're, we're taking that call in SIP, but it's going to our TDM network. And we have heard those anecdotes again and again and again. I don't have any data that, you know, numbers I can show, but anecdotally, that is widespread. And we do have data on the number of calls that our customers receive with passports. And it's about 25%. Three quarters of all calls that come into our customers' network and we verify those calls for them, they don't have a passport. And there are a lot, you know, supposedly, you know, we understand there are a lot more calls than that being signed put onto the telephone network. And we suspect, and we're not the only ones, I think most people tend to agree that conventional wisdom is, those calls are being dropped in TDM transit. But there are some intermediate providers that are better than others. So you may want to shop around because there's some carriers out there, smaller providers who have gone out and selectively bought their SIP interconnects to make sure they get a SIP interconnection all the way to the end with the three, primarily the three big wireless carriers to make sure those calls aren't going to go over a TDM link when they go to one of the big wireless carriers. Because that's really what most people are interested in, getting that that AI attestation to a wireless handset. So, but how do you do that? You know, as an enterprise, how do you check? It's interesting, there's some tools out there on the internet, and uh, we have a customer, and there are others as well, and if you come up later, I can give you the link, it's too, it's too uh, long to describe here. But they have a list of five telephone numbers you can call. Five different providers. They've got DIDs from five different providers, including, you know, the big guys. And you can call one of those numbers. And if you call one of those numbers from your network that originates calls, should be originating calls with a shaken passport, it'll get to the far end and you will, it'll give you a readout on the web, you know, on a user interface, on, on a browser. Did the passport get there? And it will display the passport and the certificate information about who signed that call. And uh, you can find out, you know, did my call get there? So I tried this uh, a few months ago from my AT&T handset. I called all five numbers only one telephone number for one carrier delivered the passport. And uh, the other four, you know, I don't know where they ended up, but they, you know, my passport didn't get to the end. So there's an example, if you're an enterprise, you know, you can make a call from your, you know, from your business and you can take your service rider to task if they don't deliver the uh, passport end to end. So that's just one check. There are others out there on the network as well, so. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to jump yeah, go jump slightly to a different topic. And I apologize if I skip ahead to one of your questions, but there's, you know, why is it important for these passports to make it all the way? Is there is a feature that is part of Stir Shaken that, in the end, will make a big difference for for enterprises, and it's this uh, feature they call rich call data. But the idea being is that not only am I going to send the passport to the far end, but I'm going to be able to include, for example, a logo so that when your phone rings, it doesn't just say Walmart, right, with a check mark, it'll have the Walmart logo on it, or your pharmacy, or the school district, or the police department, or wherever it might be, to give people uh, an improved perception and reliability and more likely to answer the call. So there are organizations working very, very hard to put together these kinds of applications that, that deliver what they call call branding. That's the kind of the use case for um, some of this rich call data. Now, there are some mechanisms today that some, um, some companies in the industry are using to deliver that information to mobile handsets. 
Um, but the mechanism you know, is defined within the stir shaken standard to deliver this rich call data. And if the passport's not getting there, I can guarantee the rich call data is not getting there, and therefore the call brandy is not going to happen. So there is a vision down the road that when your phone rings, it's going to have a logo and it's going to have a check mark next to it, and you're going to know for sure it's your it's your school district or it's your auto dealership telling you your car's ready or whatever. You don't have to worry about the warranty call, right? So that's the goal. Now we, to get there, we got to solve some of these other problems and uh, take some diligence. Uh, so robocalling has effectively killed the cold call, and any of you can chime in at this time, but how can enterprises improve their call answer rates? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, and that's, you know, that's what we're all totally focused on, is improving that call answer rate for enterprises, because, you know, it, it, as Greg noted, it, and nobody answers the phone unless you know for sure who it's coming from. So it's very, very important that we as an industry work to resolve that, you know, put some trust back in there. So yeah, man, who wanted to see it? Yeah, um, I feel like you guys are super technical and knowledgeable, and I'm like the explain it like I'm five person uh -huh. on this panel. <laughs> but we always need one of those people. Um, so it, just some things that you can do. Obviously, I'm I'm coming at it more from a marketing side of the house, but you know you can work with your marketing teams and as they're doing outreach or your SDR team, whatever um, the, which, whichever team's doing those, and use automated workflows for like low intent leads that will allow you to rest lists right because the goal is to avoid any practices that could get flagged as robocalling so if you use automated workflows on these kind of low intent leads to put gaps in and rest those lists over time that will allow you to not be flagged as just calling 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 and then obviously speaking from a contact center perspective for high intent leads utilize your omni channel Voice calling is not your only way to reach these customers. Use text, use email, um, use voicemail drops, you know, use these things in order to be able to try and reach your customers consistently and be a drumbeat, but not only using the voice side of things. May I ask a question? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I've had these conversations. I didn't have any answers, but, you know, this this problem, everybody has this problem. Their calls, I mean, they're being labeled as spam. They're not being picked up. Our, our customers complain. We don't really, you know, we hear a lot of different solutions. So rotate, you know, lower the, the call velocity mm -hmm. and, and rotate numbers helps, we hear. Mm -hmm. But there's some, you know, I guess C name, you need a really good C name. If mm -hmm. you don't have C name, you're in trouble, and uh, so you got to make sure you have a good C name. Does that make sense, y'all? Is that yes. y'all agree? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one I wanted to hear about what your experience has been. We had a customer. He had brand new DIDs. You know, he's starting. He's starting to launch a new business. He's got new DIDs. He goes to make a call, and uh, it's blocked right off the bat by his service provider, and said, well, you know, that call has no history has no reputation. It looks like a robocaller, because that's the robocalls, go, 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 they get a big block of numbers and they start pounding away for a day, it gets shut down, they have another number. Mm -hmm. So this is a legitimate customer. He can't make a call because he's getting blocked right off the bat, and it's a catch-22. He can't yeah. get any history because uh, he can't make a call. Can't. I mean, do you, have you seen that problem? Yes. That seems yeah. just absurd. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of one of those like chicken and the egg, thing, you know, and it's like, how do you develop the reputation in order to be able to kind of get that history to develop the calls? And again, I think there's ways that you can use technology. There are providers out there that will help you be more likely to get calls through. So we, for example, one of our outbound dialers is called Human Call Initiator. So it is a human initiated form of calling that goes out there that actually uh, you have a clicker agent who's just doing the out there clicking numbers but it's then getting sent through the system in an automated fashion and just like an auto dialer when the customer answers it goes to a live agent but because it is considered human call initiated it doesn't it's less likely to get flagged as that robo calling uh, kind of technology and then we also use um, I think if you're able to use other mediums like texting and what have you and start to get activity on the phone number, over time you can hopefully start to build that reputation and kind of shortcut the chicken and the egg situation that you're having. So, may I ask another question? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know. 
So this is, raise your hand if you've had a customer or if you're a victim, you've got a completely legitimate business and your call's being mislabeled as spam. Has that ever happened to anybody? Yeah. Well, it happens with some of our, our customers. Some of your customers, yeah. like a hospital, yeah. you know, or your doctor. Doctor, yeah. Yeah, you already said that. What, what do you... What do you do about that? So there are people who have false positives that run these analytics engines. Mm -hmm. Do you ever talk to them? Yes. What do you say? And I do not know the answer to that question, so I'm gonna yeah, blab fact, it the other way. You call them up, what do you say? You say like, you know, I've got a, an orphanage. They're trying to mm -hmm. make an outbound call and uh, it's being labeled as spam. Well, mm -hmm. How does that conversation go? I've never called these people because I'm, you know, I'm a software guy. D yeah, and it, it's hard because, I mean, we can do, as a service provider, we can take all the steps, right, to get that level of access. But it, it, it comes down to the telco carriers too, right? Like you had said, if the, the telco carrier is not done their steps and it still ends up going through and getting blocked and we're like we've done everything so you now you need to reach out to them and see what's happening on their end that's causing this roadblock yeah. in the yeah. middle well you know the, the roadblock is generally there's a handful of companies who have reputation databases there's only a handful of them and those almost all those companies have some form of redress mechanism to be able to get off the blacklist the problem is, is you, it's kind of a, you know, it's an Easter egg hunt to go find out which reputation service is the one who flagged you, and then secondly, to go actually and apply for a redress relief uh, on those kinds of calls. So, like for example, we've been working with Secure Logix for a number of years um, on their, you know, their blacklist database um, mechanism, and and that's a big piece of it. Is you know, when people get on the blacklist. There, you know, there's a redress mechanism that they've got, but the tr the problem is you don't know. The hospital doesn't know that their calls are being blocked because of, you know, a particular database. They've gotten into a particular database, and so that um, you have to kind of do this Easter egg hunt to get a hold of all these different reputation databases and say, are you the one? Are you the one? Are you, you know, what's my reputation on your database? And I and I honestly believe a lot of these kind of reputation data, these reputation services are quickly going to pick that up and offer that as an option as part of their, you know, we're gonna manage your web and your social media, but they're eventually gonna offer your, uh, you know, your, your robocall reputation too. Yeah. For a fee. For a fee, nothing's so, free. Price. Uh, so yeah. your, your call is being mislabeled as spam, but I'll fix it for a fee? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So how does that yeah. feel? Feels like, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> because all of this, it's, I mean, you talk about stir shaking in the context of mitigation and not solving the problem. We can't guarantee that the calls aren't going to get labeled as spam likely, even though we have taken all the steps. What we can do is at least say for our piece, our, from point A to point B, we've done everything we can to mitigate as much as we can to increase your odds that this will go through. But I mean, it is the Easter egg hunt. Yeah. And yeah, and, and a lot of large enterprises now are starting to adopt these, um, you know, their own robocall mitigation platform. So you know, the service provider delivers the call to the enterprise, and then the enterprise, you know, large bank, does not want known bad actors to get into their call center because that's you know it's an extra risk. So they'll use the blacklist, right, to block inside their own switch, their own contact center. To block those numbers um, and the problem is you know if you manage to work your way onto that list you'd have to go find the blacklist provider to get off of it and then wait for a refresh cycle to happen so that the bank then doesn't see you as a as a blacklist number so yeah it's complicated and by the way you know this whole same thing's hap happening with you know the, the any of the reputation services you just kind of say yeah it's you know 50 bucks a month to have somebody monitor your reputation you know they're looking at social media they're looking at your you know your domain reputation or you know all this stuff and i think that your your telephone numbers are going to quickly go into that pile of things and yeah it, it's uh it sucks you know <laughs> what we do is get bad guys to making the phone calls and the problem will go away well, and, and you know, for the partners in the room and the agents, it's worth researching these companies because it is, you know, to their point, going to be a more widespread issue. All of this, the pieces that are happening with stir shaken and flagging, flagging calls on the voice side, is it's going to start happening more and more on the text side as well because they're passing, what is it, the TCR, yeah. to kind of make sure that spam texts are 
controlled because we're all getting more and more of those. So again, if, you, if you're an agent in the room or you're a partner, you know, look into some of those reputation management companies because your customers are going to need it and they're going to come to you if their calls are getting flagged. They're going to be like, hey, who is this provider that you hooked me up with that's causing, um, you know, because I'm still getting flagged as spam likely, so maybe kind of look at it as a stacked solution. Knowledge is power, right? Really? Yeah, education is very good. Yeah, absolutely. Because they, they view it as, okay, they're doing everything that they can. They're letting me know what the process is and they're helping me fix the problem. Yeah. yeah. I have a question for the group. How, who's heard of freecallregistry.com? Just one hand, nobody else has heard of that? Uh, so it is a, it's a single website where you can go in and you'd feel like your call is being mislabeled as spam. You can enter your number there and your information and then that gets sent out to three companies, TNS, Hyatt, and First Orion. Those are the three primary robocall analytics providers for the three wireless uh, service providers. And you know, so now you've got, you go to each company and you have to make your case, you know, it's, no, there's no charge, but you know, this is a legitimate number, it shouldn't be blocked. Um, if you raise your hand, you've been there. Have, have you used that site? How was your user experience? Were you satisfied from the experience? Hit or miss. Hit or miss. Okay. That's, that's better than I expected. So there you go. There's a hit or miss way to resolve this at no charge. Go to freecallregistry.com. And, uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Okay. And, oh, is that right? Uh, have I got the name right? What's that? No, it's, I've misstated it. It's definitely, yeah, free call registry. I, th I may be misremembering that, but it's a, uh, it's definitely out there. But it's a, the next step is if you're not satisfied, it's hit or miss, you're not satisfied with that, you can engage with them, like Alan was saying, you know, to, to monitor your numbers and they'll let you know, hey, your call's being labeled a spam and then, you, you know, you're paying them and you maybe got a little bit more leverage, I don't know, to get it put on the white list. I'm not sure. Question of free caller, caller. free caller registry. Thank you for the correction. All right, so we've got like a few minutes left. Are there any questions from the audience? Go ahead. So we talked about these smaller providers, right, that have sometimes their uh, calls uh, attestated at the high level, uh, upstream, right? So what is the actual regulation currently? You know, what is the smaller provider supposed to do and not supposed to do like what what is the rule are every like is everybody supposed to be uh, having this still shaking or do smaller providers you know can they still rely on the upstream and it's still properly i guess from the legality of it is properly registered whatever i don't know how to explain it but or every single one of them is supposed to have their own implementation of it without relying on the upstream I'll let you take that one. Okay. Take a stab at that. <laughs> yeah. I'll add my opinion. Okay. So the question is, small providers, you know, do they have to sign their own calls or can they let their uh, intermediate carrier sign calls on their behalf? That's, that's the question. And uh, so I think the, the, here are the rules from the FCC, and this, they have not made a declaratory ruling on it has to be this way. But uh, what they've said very clearly is the originating service provider is the operator that needs to sign the call. And the originating service provider, they know the customer, they can provide that attestation. One hop down at the intermediate provider, they don't really know the enterprise customer. They're getting from the originating service provider. But there are intermediate providers who will sign calls 
from their service provider customers, small service provider customers, and if it's a DID that the intermediate provider sold to their uh, small service provider customer, they'll give it an attestation A. If it's any other number, they'll give it an attestation B. And the reason that's problematic is because the intermediate service provider who signed the call, they're signing with their certificate, they just don't know the end user. It's the originating service provider that knows the end user that can really make that attestation. So, but there are, what does work, and how as a small service provider, you can, you know, outsource your shake into an intermediate provider, is if the intermediate provider signs the call on behalf of the small service provider with the small service provider's signature. And so, I guess IntelliQuint is probably the most notable for that. You, they provide shaking on behalf of their smaller service provider customers. But the small service provider has to go to the process of registering with the Shaken Policy Administrator, getting a certificate, giving it to IntelliQuint, and now IntelliQuint's gonna sign those calls for the small service provider. It's not IntelliQuint actually signing with their certificate, they're signing with the certificate of the small provider. And that's completely within the rules of the FCC. Yeah. Because, you know, the originating service provider knows the customer, they put that, their signature on that call. It's the case where the intermediate provider is signing it with their signature. That's a, a gray area that I think, you know, the FCC may say, is, may make a ruling on that is not allowed. And I'll add a little anecdotal. I talked to somebody on Monday, um, a small service provider, um, under 10,000 sub subscribers, um, and he, you know, was not doing the signing. He had his upstream provider doing the signing for him, and, you, you know, he, came to us basically saying the gig's up I got to do it myself I got to sign this stuff myself so can you help me implement that and um, I think there's there's probably a whole host of service providers who because of the rush to implement stir shaken had to depend on their upstream service provider to get um, to get within close compliance and now they realize they need to finish it out and and get their own certificate and then be able to then sign their own calls so there's still there's still a little bit of work to be done, but one point also too I want to make is, as we talked about in the session two days ago, it's critical that small service providers know their customers. That's the one, as we was the metaphor we used, the, what the hole in the bucket that, you know, where the, all the data is leaking is um, small service providers seem to be the ones where most of the fraud is now coming into the network and it's because the smaller service providers were given a pass and that they're allowed to let some of this traffic into the network. And the bad guys have found, you know, these um, weaknesses in the security perimeter. And, they're the, and that's how today, how most of this is getting, the, and the way to stop it is with good, strong, know your customer policies. Matt, provide a different yeah. perspective? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a little controversy on the panel's good. Yeah. I would say the small service providers, those are the people who really know their customers. True. And uh, it's not the small service providers, it's, uh, well, it's people who are, it's, it's, it's the nefarious traffic is coming from folks, I believe, who are going straight to the intermediate carriers. Mm -hmm. and, and you've totally missed that know your customer link. And, uh, you know, from, our, from the, what we have seen, the people who we have dealt to, the small service provider, the managed service providers, they're the, I mean, in my mind, it's the FCC's dream. They really know their customers. I mean, they're managing their firewall. They're managing maybe even their print server. I mean, all kinds of stuff for their customers, and they really know their customers. So they'd say, uh, I, I just have to stand up a little bit for the small service providers, and because uh, I think, I think it's, it's a beautiful thing, the, the, the way they serve their customers and the traffic they put on the network. It's the, uh, it's the guys that send traffic directly from their boiler room to the intermediate providers. Those are the people I that worry me in yeah. terms of robocalls. calls coming from here and there yeah but they'll find a hole that's the one they will thing. find a hole and yeah. and you know <laughs> yeah yeah sure there's some small service providers that are part of that mix as well but uh there are uh, so many really excellent small service providers well i want to thank everybody for being with us this morning let's give these this panel a round of applause yep thank you